Good morning. It's Brian here. It is Expert Dojo Hour. You are again listening to a phenomenal entrepreneur who we are investing in. You're, you're looking at a great company that we believe is going to become a unicorn. And you are going to listen to an incredible journey about how ARPIT is going to get there. So I now would like to start a wonderful conversation where we're going to talk about the journey of a unicorn. Arpa, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. Great to be here. Excellent. And we're going to talk about Haifa, which is your baby, which is your creation, which you've taken to the world. And I have to say, when you, when you and I first had a conversation about this, the world of where I saw it, which was project management, and just how do you get all of these crazy things that are happening to us in one place where we can manage them all, it just seems so simple and so perfect to me. And I know it's a heck of a lot more complicated than that. So I would like, if you could, to explain in as few or as many sentences as you like, Haifa and what it does in the world and how it simplifies what is otherwise an unbelievably complicated and difficult thought process whenever any organization is trying to make decision-making in an area of innovation. Perfect. So uh, let me start with the big picture first uh, in terms of what drives growth in companies. Uh, we all know that innovation is the single most important factor that drives a company's growth. So the top innovators, they grow 10 to 15%, uh, 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 they, they grow 2x faster than all the others, and there are only 10, 15% of them in the whole spectrum of companies. The spending on innovation is doubling over the next five years to five and a half trillion dollars. But despite all that, despite knowing how uh, innovation is important to the success of companies. Over 94% uh, of leaders are unhappy with their firm's innovation performance. Because they, is- they, because they understand that innovate or die. Exactly. So, yeah, so they, so they understand, they get that innovation is important, but they are still unhappy about innovation, their firm, their own firm's innovation performance. And when we look deeper, there are three key reasons why that is so. Uh, First is siloed activity within the organization. Second, whatever they are doing, it's not aligned with with, uh, their uh, corporate strategy and strategic objectives. And third is their own inability to spot key trends and signals and act on them. I want to stop you there. I want to stop you there. Because I am, I, I sometimes, especially when we go into very specific, phrases which explain something really well on its own, but they can sometimes get lost in translation. So I want to start with the first one. When you say siloed decision-making, what you mean is this, is that there's a bunch of stuff happening in a company. Let's say the company is Barclays Bank. You're over in the UK, so we'll take a nice big bank over in the UK. We'll call it Barclays Bank. And we'll say, like, Barclays Bank have a million things happening. They might have a ton of branches over here. They might have a bunch of competition over there. They might have a lot of things which are happening within the online banking space. Then there might be a lot of things happening within these neo banks, the new banks that are coming in. And all of these things actually affect any innovation that they are going to make in the future right? However, generally, because there's so much information and it's in so many different places, they do not get taken into account when that innovation decision is being made, right? That's the point you're making. Absolutely. And, you know, when we talk about silos, we mean silos of knowledge, asset, insights, and strategy. And by silos of of all these things, they could be, uh, you know, when we talk about internal resources and capabilities, There could be external resources and capabilities, your partners and what's outside the organization, Uh, your knowledge, your insights or resources. They could lie in the form of quantitative data or or information or knowledge or qualitative. And they could be about what you have done in the past, what you're doing in the present and what might be expected to happen in the future. So across all these dimensions, uh, knowledge is... Uh, trapped and scattered and fragmented, and it, what they're all—they're like, all over the place. And, and here's yes. the, here's the, so here's the thing: I know right now during this podcast, the chairman of Barclays is saying, "No, no, 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 Brian, we got this. Like we know 
all of these things happening. And I would say to you, yes, Mr. and Mrs. Chairman, you do know these things. However, where do you know them, right? I'm guessing your competition information is probably sitting in a, G- in a Google spreadsheet somewhere. Now, let's talk about like all of the pictures or of all of the different competitors you have out there. Maybe that's sitting in your Dropbox. Now, I also know that if we're talking about like the evolution of how you're going to the next level, that's in a strategy folder. That's sitting in Switzerland somewhere. So the, the argument here is not that this information does not exist anywhere. The argument yes. is it's way worse than that. You have the information somewhere. You're just not using it, dingbat. Okay. That's so well said. And you know, the most common statement we've heard organizations say, if only we knew what we knew. So yeah, they already know all that, but it's just sitting all across and not accessible to people when they need it. So we all agree, huge problem. Okay, let's go back to number two. The first one was silo. The second one was? Uh, uh, whatever you are doing, innovation activity is not aligned with strategy or strategic objectives. So yeah, we have lots of action happening, people undertaking various projects or initiatives, again, all across the company, but how do they relate to what the company is trying to do at an overall level? What strategic objectives does it fulfill on? How does it contribute to what's important to the company? That view, that overarching view is often missing in organizations that's why they do a lot of stuff they uh, they they talk the right language but the impact is not felt in the boardroom absolutely and again this comes back to this comes back to positioning so it's about having this in one place of course you have your vision statements of course you have your balance scorecard of course you have your strategy meetings and your monthly meetings and your stand up meetings and of course you know where the company is going but as this innovations coming in it's important that this information is, and I think on this side of it, it's probably more accessible, this information, because it's more closer to their heart. However, you want to make sure that it's in one place. That's all. You want to make sure that as you're making the decisions on the innovation, that decision is almost tied in intrinsically. It's like a Rubik's Cube. You want to make sure that your dots of your whites and your blues and your reds and your yellows, that they're all on the same cube. And normally when you're making innovation decisions, the department making them, whether it's an IT department or whether it's going to be your biz dev department, they're not making decisions with all of that information clearly in front of them. So again, it's about making sure you have it right there. Great point. What was number three? Number three is inability to spot and act on key trends and developments. So this is not fully absorbing what's happening in the marketplace until it's too late because all those insights and all that information doesn't get surfaced or uh, doesn't get uh, recognized in the right teams at the right time. So either you are too late or you have missed the bus. So and this is, this is an interesting one, by the way, because this is one that generally I find companies don't have. I find that what they do is they will periodically arrange for project groups who will go out there, our consultants, which is even worse, um, who will go out there and then they will do a, an activity because that's what it is. It's a one-time event, which is sometimes repeated and sometimes not. And that activity is to find that, hey, what's going on in the market? What do our competitors look like? What does the, what's happening within changes? How has COVID affected the world? Come back to me with the report. We'll read it to the boardroom and then we put it on a shelf somewhere, right? So I actually find that this is sorely lacking in an organization. And I know when you and I spoke before, one of the things that really compelled me about what you're building is the fact that this is a multi-level ongoing engagement. It is a not an activity. Every single member of an organization should be contributing to what the forces are in your market that could potentially affect you going forward. Absolutely. You know, the name of our company itself, Haifa, it's inspired by uh, how trees and forests communicate and grow. So Haifa is actually the name of the underground network uh, through which trees communicate. And it's through those, uh, they exchange nutrients, water, and information with the sole purpose of growing the forest. And it's a very active, dynamic, engaging, open, accessible, intelligent network. 
And that's what we believe companies should be like as well. Companies should be like forests. And uh, for them to function like one, it's having this intelligent network through which all these uh, various uh, parts or elements of an organization, the people, what it knows, its knowledge, assets, strategy, insights, they all need to be connected into a network. Beautiful. Okay. And what else? What are we missing? Is there one final one? Uh, no, I think those, those three problems uh, are what leads to over 90% of leaders, 94 to be precise, uh, being unhappy with their firm's innovation performance. And uh, the reason for that, as we just talked about, all, all of that, it relates to the fact that knowledge is fragmented and trapped. And this is tough. This is tough. Like, how did you do this? this? Is like, so you realize this problem, which is not a small problem. Okay, <laughs> this is a big problem, and I don't just mean big outcome on the solution. I mean it's hard to even hold this. Even you trying to fix this problem, it's like pouring grains of sand into your hand and hoping it doesn't it doesn't fall through. So, number one, when was your epiphany? When was your moment when you thought? oh my goodness, the entire decision-making process for innovation is broken and it can never be fixed if people follow the existing path. And then this is the solution that we should implement. And then you deciding this is the solution that I will implement. Right. So actually, there wasn't one single epiphany moment, but it's been a series of epi uh, epi epiphany moments over the past uh, few years. So my co-founders, uh, Louis French and Chris Thompson, uh, they've been working in an innovation consulting company for over 20 years. And I was also part of uh, that team 12 years ago. And we've kept in touch over the years. They kept on doing projects where uh, piecemeal by piecemeal, clients asked them to fix this problem. That, okay, can I, I want to just run a uh, innovation project, but this is missing. Someone else said, okay, I want to do this this is missing. And somewhere down the line, we all started realizing patterns of uh, uh, the barriers to innovation or what gets in the way of these innovation projects being successful. Uh, and at that time, the technology that was available was quite bespoke in nature. So to solve a problem, uh, the first thing you had to do was to understand uh, a client's way of seeing the world. And that meant custom coding, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, we, we, we said, yeah, okay, interesting problem, but the solution isn't the right fit as yet, which could be scalable across multiple customers. Then came uh, that we were introduced to this whole concept of uh, graph databases and graph technology. And I would say that that was the big epiphany moment when we realized that, oh, you know what? If we do it right, then we could first define the ontology or the way of a company thinks in the form of a model or a schema, and then we could connect all those things together. So if we have a graph database that provides the context in which all what the organization knows can reside. So that was the big epiphany moment. And that's when actually we decided to form Hypa as a company in April, 2020, this year. Incredible. So really you're the Oracle. You're the place where all information flows to, to have a central city to live in, right? And then all organizations will then be able to take this hub and spoke where this, 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 this form of being able to manage not just their projects, but their actual company's future in a very simple, easy to use platform, which can be accessed by everybody from their employees to the chairman of the operation and to even their partners and uh, collaborators and startups they want to work with. So yeah, we call it an innovation intelligence platform, which connects knowledge, data, insights, resources, and strategy across formats, across time, uh, and across sources. Wonderful. So, and if you're painting us a good. picture of what that looks like, um, help us along. So you create it for an organization, let's say the organization, is is you know tens of thousands of people what would it look like yeah what would it look like is the first thing assuming it's a large organization mm -hmm. uh, they have their strategy they have uh, 
uh, a set of people with teams in different departments, uh, marketing, customer research, sales, uh, spread across different locations. Uh, then there are, there's a lot of research that they subscribe to. Then there's a team which, tag, which tracks trends. Uh, and then it all comes together in innovation projects that uh, uh, they might be working on, which use all that knowledge, what's happening in the market, what our strategy is, what kinds of customers do we want to serve, what products do we have already in the marketplace? What are their attributes? Uh, what kind of uh, competition are we facing in the market? Who's emerging, who's not? So imagine someone goes in, logs in out there on that, in the, in, onto uh, the HiFi Innovation Intelligence Platform and they see, okay, everything, you can see your strategy, you can see your resources, you can see your markets, products, they're, they're all grouped together. And then the beauty is once you click on one of them, you click on a strategy, you can see, okay, what projects are happening which fulfill on this strategy? And you can see across time horizon, what has been delivered, what's in the next six months, what's in the next 12 months, what's in the next 18 months. Okay, this project is interesting. Let me click on that. Okay, uh, it says it's, uh, well, so-and-so is working on it. That's interesting. Let me see what skills and capabilities does that person have? Okay, where is that person located? So everything is connected to everything else. Uh, so that's just to give you an example of how you can start anywhere uh, and get the complete picture of what's happening uh, as relevant to your role. Perfect. And then if you talk about it, your personal journey in this, because I think like everybody gets it, you've built, you've built a monster. And actually, in many ways, it replaces... I won't say it replaces some of the large consulting companies, but it certainly provides a format for companies to be able to build their own. And as you were explaining that, I was I was imagining a farmer, you know, two farmers beside each other, and one farmer who hasn't really grown anything for a long time is a little bit lazy, and you know, they're they they have some friends come for dinner, and they say, "Oh, I would love a nice big dinner," and the farmer quickly says to his son, "Go down and buy buy some vegetables and some carrots and some milk, and make sure you get some wine and get some other things as well." And then the other farmer on the other farm has exactly the same situation, but he's been growing, or she hmm? has been growing carrots potatoes and parsley and everything for years. So what you're really doing is you're encouraging companies to create that, that central database, which becomes this growing living organism. So as they are continually dealing with innovation, because innovation is, again, not a one-time event. It is a process. And as they're continually dealing with innovation, they always have that beautiful meadow and that beautiful farm with all of these different tools that they require whenever they need it. When they want a carrot, they pick it. And when they want to go and look at competition, well, that's okay. That's over with the potatoes. So they do that. And they got the cows in the next field if they need some milk. So that is all in one place where they always know where to get everything. Would you say that's a reasonable analogy? Oh, absolutely. That's a fantastic uh, analogy. Absolutely. And by innovation, we just don't mean new product development or those big bang innovation. Uh, in our view of innovation, it's all about making things better. So it could be whether you're trying to improve your process uh, or your product or your services or your business model, whether it's incremental, whether it's transformational. Yeah, it's all encompassing. So it doesn't always have to be that new uh, uh, the idea that's going to change the world. It's about making your business grow. Fantastic. Okay. I want to, I want to go on a personal journey with you. Everybody gets the product. Everybody sees how incredibly simple it is and how you've taken something dispersed and complicated and useless and you've brought it into a central location whereby all companies should be using it as their central resource. But what about you in a personal journey? So you you started this company I mean, it's not easy, especially when you've got families and when you've got responsibilities and you suddenly go from being incredibly high level and getting paid a ton of cash to saying, I'm going to change the world. And especially doing it in the UK, right? In yeah. America, you get forgiven for everything and especially for being brave and going out there and taking on the world and building greatness. But you're from the UK. I'm from Ireland. We get punished for this stuff. Like yes. we do this stuff and, and they say, punished. you crazy, stupid idiot. What are you do? following your dreams? Will you get back out there and start some work? Yeah. 
you know, we had this premonition that this is the time to do it. Mm. And it's now or never. So that's, that's where all of us had the conviction that, okay, we are doing it now. That's it. We are doing it. And when we started, the odds were probably stacked against us. You know, it was just us. We had half a framework built. Uh, some clients had been interested in it, uh, but we wanted them to switch over to the HIFA platform. Uh, so, and then we didn't have a very uh, a large engineering team. Uh, so, and people were not devoting uh, uh, their entire time to it. So, you know, the usual startups of getting uh, time, resources, commitment. Uh, so, the first positive sign that we uh, that we saw was when uh, when we started getting customers, and. That happened fairly soon, actually. We've been revenue generating from our first month, which is not something that happens too often uh, with uh, startups. Bravo. So, so uh, yes, as I mentioned, uh, Bar Dynamics had been working with some customers who had been using some version of the framework. And then we went back to them that, look, this is what we are building and uh, we'd like you to adopt Haifa. And yeah, they were like, okay, sure, let's go ahead. In fact, one of them, wrote a scientific paper in a reputed uh, journal uh, and that acknowledged HIFA as the innovation tool on which their research roadmaps, which is what they use to spot gaps in knowledge and capabilities so they can direct funding to areas that projects that address those gaps. And they mentioned HIFA as the innovation tool. So that was the first sign of, uh, you know, that's when we first started getting a sense of confidence that, okay, this can work. Uh, so, we start yeah, from no clients, small team to having these four seed clients. Uh, and then uh, we knew we had to make a lot of progress on product development uh, and uh, especially building the AI ML capabilities for which we needed a team. So we looked around and we said, okay, let's go to India for uh, hiring talent. That's when we know we can be fast, we can be flexible mm -hmm. and we, have, we can get access to some really top-notch engineering talent. So and that's you, where and we you, went. And you know, and by the way, you know how much I like India, you know, with, with all the entrepreneurs you're bringing from India. India is on fire right now. And it's a very smart way to do it because it meant that you already had the expertise. So you had the perfect project manager in-house and you could manage that team to do exactly what you wanted them to do. How, how many people did you hire initially over in India? Well, we hired them one by one, depending on how our revenues came in and, uh, you know, how much we could put into the company or rather we, how much we could afford to put in uh, to yeah. the company. So we started with one, then the next month we had another, next month we had, we had another. So yeah, today we are a team of uh, nine uh, wow. across, across uh, UK, Spain and uh, India. Okay. And were you ever in doubt of what you were building? No, we, you know, somehow the conviction has always been there that this is a problem that has to be solved. And we don't see any other way except what, how we are doing it to solve it. We've come across some really interesting com companies and they're doing some really cool stuff. But the way uh, we are solving this problem, we haven't seen any company try to solve it that way. So yeah, we've never had any doubt whatsoever in our minds that what we are doing is something that would be valuable to our clients. And yeah, it will provide long lasting benefits to them. I love it. And then, so you built it, you put it together. I know it will always be a work in progress, but you got your version out, you got your alpha out and you've started that with companies. I love the fact that you started driving revenue straight away. The only test in the world is what your customers say. And if your customers like it, tick in the box. If your customers pay for it, Tick in the box multiplied by 10, and you've got both. So speak to us a little bit about customer traction, and you don't have to give names unless you want to, but, um, but what are they using it for? What kind of benefits are you getting? And then how do you see that growing forward? Yeah, so our customers use HIFA for a variety of things. Uh, there's one organization which uses it across their brand marketing team globally uh, to create uh, a culture of beer, uh, in the organization and that's the hi-fi is the place where they combine all what they know about marketing 
about technology. So the brands and the brand attributes, the technology, how beer is made and the consumer perspective in terms of what they value. So all these perspectives come together in Haifa. Uh, they have over a thousand uh, active users uh, of the platform. Another organization is using us to, using Haifa to manage its portfolio of innovation products, mm -hmm. uh, projects. So over uh, 200 projects. Uh, and uh, one of the things they were struggling with was how do we align them to strategy? So that's what they are using uh, Haifa for, for making sure that all what they are doing is aligned with their strategy. Another uh, interesting implementation uh, is in uh, the, the whole product design and innovation space. And we were quite surprised because we, are just a, we, we were a startup just five or six months uh, uh, into being, and we managed to secure one of the top 50 brands in the world as a client. Wow. And they are using wow. us not for, let's say, all that operational efficiency stuff for uh, making a better widget. They're using us for, uh, well, creating products that would see the light uh, two years down the line, and that would define the future growth of the company. And they're using Haifa to demonstrate to the whole organization that this is the concept we want to build. This is, these are the users it serves. These are the situations they use the product in. This is how it aligns with the strategy. So how everything is related, that's what anyone uh, on the platform can see. Amazing. So, yeah, and, and then, when we got that, we were go over the moon and yeah, that how can such a small company, yeah, win such Amazing. a big brand. So that's May just to give you a sample of the kind of projects we are winning. Yeah, incredible. And you're, you're absolutely right. Getting a large brand as a small startup is virtually impossible. Getting a large brand with a small startup when you're building extremely complicated technology that speaks to their absolute innovation, which is the only thing that keeps them alive, is a hell of a lot more impossible. So how do you see that going in the future? You've already done the impossible. You've built it. You've got an amazing team. The timing is absolutely right for this. Now we have organizations, previously, they could at least pretend to be on top of this by collaborating person to person. So they would all fly to Paris. They would have their board meeting. They would have dinner in the evening and everybody would talk about the great things they were doing in the company. And even though you and I know that actually none of this was any kind of cohesive plan behind an innovation strategy, it at least made them feel better. Now they can't even do that. Now they have no choice because they have to focus on the task at hand. So I would imagine this is a phenomenal period for you for growth. Absolutely. And you know what an interesting example is, one of our customers, uh, early seed customers in uh, Latin America, so we had a feature in our tool which allowed people to collaborate. So essentially all what's there on the platform, they could create a cluster board around it, drop it like stickies and brainstorm and ideate around it. We thought it's just one of the features. And then we realized that's all what they use HIFO for, which is okay, except that we hadn't designed the platform to be used by thousands of users generating 10,000 stickies in one cluster board, uh, infinite cluster board. So yeah, we, we had to really scale up our game during that one week when they started it, uh, started using it. But that's just, just to support your point that the way things uh, will happen in the future, they'll be totally different from how they have happened in the past. Where we see ourselves going forward is, yes, I would say that we have built the foundation of a, of a great product it absolutely solves uh, current uh, problems and potential future problems. We'd like to make it more intelligent by especially bringing in some of that AI ML capabilities of uh, getting external information uh, from the outside world into the Haifa platform. But what makes it uh, unique is that it's not just, you know, getting a feed of data that itself is not very valuable but being able to put that in the right place on the platform uh, based on the what we call the context that, okay, all this data, this would be relevant to this team in this section. So that's something that we want to further build on. And uh, yeah, so we'll, it's innovation intelligence platform. The future direction is to make it more and more and more intelligent.
I love it. And then how will that revenue grow? So right now, how much is our raise? Where's that going to take the revenue to? And then what are the raises have we got planned for 2021 and 2022? Yeah, okay. So as of now, we are doing, so we have uh, six clients right now. And uh, our MRR is, okay, is it okay if I use sterling as a currency? Of course, of course. Yeah, my mind thinks in pounds. So. No, hit me, yeah. hit us in sterling. All right. It's okay. more money, so it's better. It's only yeah. when you start hitting us in pesetas or rupees or so, then that's tougher, right? Because but sterling is great, especially for American investors. It's more money. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Right now we have six clients and we are doing an MRR of, um, yeah, somewhere between five and 10K. Excellent. Our our target is to double the number of clients over the next six months Mm -hmm. and uh, increase the MRR by three to four times, so Mm -hmm. to 20K uh, uh, pounds. And uh, uh, that's why we are raising the pre-seed round of uh, about 300, 350,000 pounds mm-hmm. or roughly half a million USD. And we want to use that money to build a solid engineering team and also lay the foundation for our for a strong inbound growth marketing engine and our sales and marketing capability uh, so that we can commence an early scale-up phase, uh, H2 after, H2 onwards. So yeah. after summer. And we do envisage going in for a seed round funding of mm-hmm. 1.5 million pounds or mm-hmm. about 2 million US dollars. The milestone we want to reach over the next 12 months is, so we've gone from six to 11 clients in six months and MRR of five to 10K to 20K. We want to increase that to over 50K yeah. uh, in the next 12 months. And of course, established presence in US, which I think would be our biggest market and that's where we see a lot of our growth uh, coming of course from. of course yeah this is going to be a perfect market for you and the kind of numbers you're speaking to are very 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 standard numbers for us investors i mean they like this they like the fact that by the time you're going to be raising your seed of 1.5 you're going to be on 50 grand a month with recurring revenue with large customers which is fantastic and the customers are not dominated with any one particular customer you're going to have yourself somewhere between 20 and 40 customers who are actually going to be in there and then you get to 2022 right you've just taken 1.5 million dollars you've closed Closed your round successfully. You were doing fifty grand a month. What happens in twenty twenty two with that fifty thousand a month? Oh well, we just go on a turbocharged mode, and uh, yeah, we are absolutely we are we are doing. We intend to do about one hundred and fifty k a month uh, kind of MRR uh, with about thirty clients, and one of the big and we want to expand the management team. And the, actually, there are two target markets for us. There's, of course, the straightforward uh, corporate innovation market, mm-hmm. but we also we also think there's big potential for impact innovation. So these are uh, organizations solving big global challenges. For example, we are working with one right now on animal disease control, and it requires multiple entities across multiple uh, countries and corporate bodies, sponsors, researchers, all of them to come together in an ecosystem. We, we think that that also is a big opportunity for Haifa to add value to what they're doing. So uh, come 2022, we want to have at least two clients uh, on impact innovation. And yeah, we will go in for a series A of about $3 million or £2 million at that Beautiful. time. So that's our uh, yeah, 18 to 24 month game plan. Beautiful. Very, very straightforward game plan. And I can say... Look, we only got engaged with you and with this entire investment that we love We love putting into Haifa um, only a couple of weeks ago. And in those couple of weeks, I've seen what an incredibly serious person you are, how serious your team is. I can see the impact of the platform. I was immediately... My decision to invest was immediately made when I saw that you closed large large corporation. That, for me, was incredibly impressive. To be able to do that prior to seed, for me, spoke absolute volumes. You did that by dragging yourself up by your bootlaces and bringing yourself to a place where you became a contender not because somebody put you there, but because you put yourself there. So I believe that once you've done that, 
the actual next step is very, very easy. Once you've got past that first piece, the next piece of, okay, we're going to bring it to like twice the clients. Yeah, of course you are. That's a no-brainer. And then where it gets interesting, I think, is like H2 and seeing how the product develops and where it goes to that type of level. So for all investors listening, do the same thing as us. Have a good conversation with Arpit about what they're building over there. Look into Haifa. It's not just that it has a cool Avengers name. It is also that it is an awesome company that is going to be the epicenter of innovation going forward. And innovation in this crazy new world of ours that needs something like Haifa to ground it. So I want to leave you with the last words. Um, if you can finish up with how can people contact you, your email, please the website URL, and finish up with your final dialogue about why investors should put their hard-earned money into an investment into Haifa and where you're going to take that for them. All right, perfect. So my email ID, well, first, let me start with the website. Mm -hmm. It's uh, www.haifa.cc. Perfect. So that's our website. And my email address is my first name at domain name. So arpit, A-R-P-I-T, at haifa.cc. Perfect. So uh, in summary, why should investors look at us? So firstly, we are creating a very high value emergent market category called innovation intelligence. And we will dominate that market. Second, we, we are working on a very unique and clearly identified problem with a very differentiated solution. And that's addressing key customer challenges. The biggest proof point of which is the fact that we, have, we are revenue generating and we have six clients already. Uh, there is opportunity not just on the corporate side and on the, but also on the impact innovation side. We have a solid management team with uh, my co-founders and I and the team that we have built up. Uh, we have a solid pipeline. Uh, we'll be a 50 million plus company in five years. And with Brian's blessing and coaching and training, definitely a unicorn or more importantly, the best we can be. And that's one of the reasons why we went with Expert Dojo, Brian's undying commitment to bring the best out of uh, his portfolio companies. And we know we are in safe hands. So with his blessings, we'll definitely be a unicorn. So yeah. That those would be my closing words. Hallelujah. Investors, you heard it here. Pick up the phone, have a word with Arpit, shoot him an email, arrange for that meeting and sit down and make sure that you're at least in the room and understanding what the value proposition is. We did. We're very happy with it. Arpit, it's beautiful to be on this journey with you. I'm looking forward to everything that comes in the future. Let's just make it so. Thank you so much for your support, Brian. Cheers.